Hey everyone, back again. Today is actually the first time I'm recording in my new apartment in Montreal or Montreal for anyone who might not know what Montreal means. Uh, and yeah, today I want to talk about Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology and the lighting might not be so good because I don't have all my stuff. I wasn't actually planning on doing this one, but I decided to anyways because I have to go back to London. It's, it's all very chaotic. Now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guigno, G-U-I-G-N-I-O-N. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. If you haven't done those things already and want to help me out, do them. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal if you're into that at all. Links in the description or not. No pressure, of course. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form, so there shouldn't be any ads, which is like so many people are like, the ads, find it in podcast form, then you can download it, listen to it, however many times you like without any ads, or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube, where there is also a video, so if you're into that, uh, you can go and find that there, and yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff, let's talk about Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology. Now, I've covered this text in its entirety. So you can go and find episodes on that. And I've also done, uh, I think, one other Ahmed text. I think I've done The Cultural Politics of Emotion, maybe, uh, which you can go and listen to. I'm obviously a big fan of Ahmed's work. But I, I just want to talk today about this term, queer phenomenology. And in order to do that, it's important to really begin with the term phenomenology, which is where Ahmed says that she begins. Now, she aligns her version of phenomenology, at least its history, with Edmund Husserl. Now, Edmund Husserl is kind of a forgotten figure, and I'm saying that with a big asterisk, uh, kind of really emphasizing that, that term, kind of, because he was writing at the time similarly to the time similarly to Heidegger, so he kind of fell under Heidegger's shadow a little bit, but he was a pretty notable phenomenologist, and he had some pretty uh, strong political leanings that, given the, what was going on in Europe at the time, he was obviously trying to understand these political movements uh, through his own philosophical work, through phenomenology. Now, the history of phenomenology is one that is difficult to really pin down. So you have phenomenology from Husserl, from Kant to Husserl, Heidegger, Fanon. You have all of these kinds, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre. You have all of these different branches that can, different figures that can fit into the camp of phenomenology and they are hardly congruent. They are hardly the same. So in order to really understand how Ahmed is approaching this, I think it's important, or I'm going to give you some basic points that I think will get us off the ground. And that is that phenomenology is, in its simplest form, the study of appearances and how people, humans, interact with things in the world as they come in contact with us through our senses, through our uh, ability to touch them, see them, smell them, how they appear to us through all of these different senses. And phenomenology is the study of those interactions, how we interact with things in their immediacy, and how we think about them, reflect upon them, how things become meaningful to us. So in this way, phenomenology is kind of a, it claims to be a kind of neutral enterprise, one that is just describing the experiences that all humans undergo. And that is the experience of experience, the very capacity to have engagement with things and, and others in the world. And this sets up the possibility of consciousness to some extent. It sets up the, bil the ability of emotions. Now, phenomenology claims itself to be a pretty neutral enterprise, as, as I've just said. But there are moments where it challenges that neutrality to some extent, going as far back as Kant. For example, who in the third critique, when discussing the sublime, when discussing versus the beautiful, he lays out the potential that is afforded by certain phenomena, like uh, being confronted with a, a mountain, for example, or a great storm that has the capacity to elicit a response within humans that is different if you were to just come into contact with a wall or with uh, a cupboard door that doesn't have the same kind of emotional baggage or doesn't elicit the same kind of emotional response. 
So we are, as humans, seems, seems that we are oriented towards different objects in different ways. We just have different responses to them. But while in no way focused on Kant, Ahmed performs a similar function in that she interrogates how some objects seem to draw us in more than others. Why are we oriented towards some objects in certain ways versus others in other ways. So to go back to Husserl, who had much more of an influence on her in this text, there's a moment in Husserl when Husserl is meditating on the existence of his writing table, where he sits to write and think. Now, he meditates on this writing table to say that, you know, he has a phenomenolo phenomenological engagement with this table. He views the table, it gives that table an appearance, which then has some kind of effect on him and induces some kind of emotion. And he says that he knows that while he's not necessarily looking at other things, he knows that there are things around him too. So it isn't just what you are immediately attuned to that you are aware of. So I'm looking right now at the camera, it does not mean that I'm not aware of the fact that there are other things around me. And you have to attune yourself to spaces in order to be comfortable, to feel at home, to feel at ease. So there is that capacity there, this capacity to see things that are kind of out of your purview. But Ahmed asks, well, how do we choose what these things are that we see? So she says that in order for Husserl to have this writing table, in order for him to even engage in phenomenology, depends upon largely the labor of his wife, cleaning his table, preparing his meals, getting things ready for him, or servants or, or whoever, to get things ready for him in order for him to even have this phenomenological experience and to even meditate upon that phenomenological experience to put forward his whole philosophy. So Ahmed asks, what is forgotten here in our experiencing the world and certainly in the phenomenological tradition in our meditating on it? What objects can enter into the phenomenological arena and what objects get pushed away or get disavowed? So she says that insofar as phenomenology, despite its claim to just study neutrally phenomena in the world, things that humans come in contact with, engage with, and sense, Ahmed says that phenomenology is always, to some extent, kind of queer in that it doesn't only point in a single neutral direction, it instead picks and chooses some things to understand, to grasp over others. It is quite skewed in that way. It doesn't just assume a single linear form. It, drawing upon certain histories, be it histories of colonization, of patriarchy, of racism, all of these histories are going to influence what phenomenology is even capable of recognizing and what it is not capable of recognizing. Now, it's been so effective, effective, that it has erased this fact that the very phenomenological project is one that is going to be culturally, historically, socially determined. So Ahmed says, well, why don't we just really embrace the fact that it is not? We know full well that phenomenology is going to be biased. It is going to be skewed. So let us now consider instead how we can integrate those different perspectives. How can we expand the category of phenomenology to actually account for its own skewedness, its own queerness, but do it to undo the very specific skewedness that we have, one that favors largely in the case that she's describing uh, white hetero men, how can we expand this to include differing perspectives? So in the case of, for example, race, she says that spaces are organized in such a way as to favor certain races over others, or same can apply to gender or disability versus able-bodied people who have an easier time moving through the world. Ahmed's vision is to rethink phenomenology to such an extent as to consider the ways that the world is not organized to actually accommodate all people in a neutral way, but in fact only reflects the interests of those who are in power. And that world is then, that world then conforms to them and they feel comfortable in it. They're able to move freely and easily through it. And because of that, it is all the more difficult for them to recognize that there is anything wrong at all, especially in the case of disability, where something like the height of doorknobs just feels totally normal for able-bodied people of a certain height, 
But for people that might have difficulty actually using doorknobs, suddenly what just appears to be a thing in the world that we don't even think about, we don't even meditate on, is suddenly a huge hindrance. It's a huge barrier to one's moving through the world. And so the operation of queering phenomenology is to actually be able to break out of this neutral mindscape in order to enter into the possibility, in order to consider the possibility that some spaces, some experiences, some appearances aren't really so neat as to just lend themselves to our senses and can actually be huge hindrances. They can actually be huge limitations for certain people. And the phenomenological engagement that they'll have with it is not a neutral one. It's actually one that is quite difficult, one that is one that presents a barrier to circumvent. So queer phenomenology is the practice then of considering how certain spaces, certain objects have been given the status of neutrality, of objectivity, but then undoing that just by following through with what phenomenology has always done. It has always been about certain perspectives, certain orientations, certain objects, and having them be neutral, having them be accessible, versus others being unaccessible, being uncomfortable. And she describes how those people who are, uh, enjoy comfort in the world just sit in a chair. They're just like they're sitting in a chair that conforms perfectly to them, while for others whose bodies aren't so privileged as to be able to, as to have the world conform to them, sit in this seemingly comfortable chair for those privileged people, but then find it to be quite uncomfortable because it does not match their actual needs. It doesn't match their actual phenomenological engagement with the world in a neutral, clear way. And yeah, that's pretty well it, pretty short-ish thing. If you want more on it, like I said, I've covered the whole text. You can go check that out. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Um, if you want to see more of my apartment, you probably will with time. I haven't found an actual place to record yet, uh, hence my sitting on my bed with the weird background, but I'll figure that all out with time. Uh, and yeah, take care.